Let's finish out 1 Corinthians 11. After we do that, I want to do a side-by-side -side comparison of different passages pertinent to government and governing authorities. And then, um, you know, if you, if you absolutely clamor to talk about 1 Corinthians 14 or something or spiritual gifts, I'm happy to do that. I just don't think it's all that hard to understand. Um, just evaluate a church's functioning under the reign of charismaticism or Pentecostalism for just the sole criterion of arrogance or being puffed up. And you'll see the nature of the error apart from any other discussions we could have. Um, I, there's just other stuff in Paul I'd rather talk about. So I'm just going to skip it unless there is revolt from the masses, in which case I'll renege on my mandate and uh, do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. But let's do 1 Corinthians 11. Let's finish that first. Okay. And uh, we didn't get as fast, uh, we didn't get as quickly through the stuff about headship and head coverings as I thought we would. So who knows how long we'll be talking about the Lord's Supper. But we are at 1127, where Paul says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay. Um, there is, um, there's a major difference between the vast majority of texts and the text that, the Greek text that underlies the ESV. Um, and maybe you have memorized an older version from maybe the King James that the, the majority text says eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord. And then the, the Greek um, is rather literally, whoever eats this bread and drinks or drinks the cup of the Lord uh, is unworthy of the Lord. Okay. Uh, he is then guilty or liable, enochos, of the body and the blood of the Lord. All right. Any questions about 27? We'll connect it to the verses that are tied to it, but anything about 27? Yeah. I remember, as it's been a long time ago, but I know they used, you know, some of the translations I think left out blood because they, they were saying, if you're doing this, you're going against the body of the Lord. And some of the liberal people would say, that means the church that you're guilty of. You're liberal, liberal people in the Missouri Synod or where? Yeah. In the Missouri Synod? Yeah, I, I heard that a number of times when I was younger. Okay. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting because one thing that we said before yeah, we broke. Yeah, no, you're fine. Before we broke for lunch is that that's a distinction without a difference between discerning the church and discerning the presence of Jesus in the bread and the wine, that those, those things will go together. And since they do not in Corinth, both the church and the body and blood of the Lord is despised. And for these, it was not, you know, it was just people, it was just not oppressed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's really not coincidental that open communion exists. Let's just say outside of Lutheranism before we apply this inside Lutheranism. Open communion exists in churches where the physical reality of Jesus's presence is not confessed. Any church that has a confession of the physical presence of Jesus is going to practice close communion, or at least does historically. So for instance, if you go to a Catholic mass, no one's gonna ask you who you are or what you're doing. But on the books, they practice close communion. So if there's a formal doctrinal acknowledgement of the physical presence of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, then there's gonna be close communion. 
open, so my suspicion about open communion in the Missouri Synod is it's not just about people's feelings. It is very much that. But it's also about not really having any concept of what you're saying you believe about the Lord's Supper. So the action is divorced from the doctrine. That's a guess. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a little bit more. We'll see what you'd like to discuss. As opposed to the first 14 verses in the chapter, the stuff we're doing now is like absurdly discuss, you know, discussed and well known. So, Adrian, you got some? I don't remember you saying much about uh, the, the proclamation of the Lord's death, the kata, amaleke, it's not a word that you see used for preaching much in the New Testament. Yeah. And um, my guess is that it's something like we strongly preach that so that that when you when you yeah. eat and drink you strongly preach the Lord's death. Yeah. So I wondered what you would say about this that the that the supper is this super preaching of the Lord's death. <laughs> so he's getting that from the intensifier, the prefix kat in kat angelita. Angelo is announce. This is yeah, more like shouting maybe or Proclaiming aloud. In what sense is celebrating the Lord's Supper proclaiming aloud the Lord's death? One of my favorite theologians, Todd Peppercorn, once put forth the thesis that the Lord's Supper is evangelism. Uh, that it's that it, what does this mean? That it is preaching the Lord's death. Well, you're not. It's it's not. And if it were. If it were evangelism, the word would be different, right? So um, the word would be, I mean, I hate to say, I mean, yeah, I hate to be this just kind of, you know, but I mean, it's true. Like it would be evangelize, euangelisomai, okay? Or ke russo is what a herald does in public. Katangelita is an announcement. In order for it to be evangelism, you have to assume lots of things like, you know, you got unbelievers present or something and, and they're, you know, but I don't know. I, that sounds like something people say just to be interesting or edgy, you know. So, I mean, is the rub of this simply that we, we preach Christ and Him crucified, that we think the death of Jesus is really, really important? Why? How? Look, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. I mean, yeah. Just put, I mean, just to put it in context of Corinth, I, I got you. Um, put it in context of Corinth, you're saying really loudly every time you have the Lord's Supper that Jesus died for sins, but then you ignore each other and you don't care and you act like it didn't happen and it doesn't matter to you and you go on acting like Jesus didn't really need to die because you're perfect anyway and you know everything. That's the contrast. Yeah, go ahead. The words of Jesus proclaim his death. Mm -hmm. What we call the words of institution. Yeah. So it, you can't talk about the supper apart from the death of Jesus. So I mean, I, I don't think it's that odd. You're proclaiming the Lord's death because you're actually saying the very words he said. I don't know that's an evangelistic task. simply the death is here. Give up for you. The whole, the, I mean, there, there's all kinds of weird things have been said about evangelism in relationship to divine service. And it's just like, sure, if someone wanders in and understands what's going on, which was not my experience of beginning to attend church, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. I don't know what it means. Okay. But let's say somebody does understand, that's great. But people are, people are not sitting out there in the world saying, I wish there was a guy in vestments that would say ritual words to me right now. You know, like they, that's not, 
that's not a need they're aware they have. And then, so, you know, the divine service is not going to get the job done by itself evangelistically. But then similarly, I don't need to screw with it all the time because it's not going to get the job done evangelistically. It's not there for the world to understand or appreciate. And that's fine. So you got to go talk to people you don't already know, and you need to not mess with the service all the time because it's not there to be messed with. It's not really, seems simple to me. We turn it into rocket science, and I think it's just like, you know, it's basically a Honda Civic. It gets the job done. It's good. It doesn't break down. It's good. Let's keep moving, you know? So, all right, that's my, it's one of my favorites too, so I have a lot to say about that. All right. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now your key here is in the Greek verbs. Because your Greek verb in 28 is, well, there we go. Dokimazeto, can I, let me just remind you of what's going on with the Lord's Supper. Verse 19, hina hoi dokimoi fane roi genontai en humin. So that the uh, examined, prepared, readied, whatever word you want to use for this obviously common stem, doc, the dokimoi, the prepared. So, dokimazeto de anthropos haoton, let a man prepare himself. Or really, very generically, let a person prepare himself. So this is not gender specific as the male-female discussion was. Let a person prepare himself and just in this way eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Okay, so how am I supposed to prepare myself? Well, very specifically, I don't want to eat or drink unworthily, anaxios. What's the specific context to eating and drinking unworthily? Potluck idea. Okay, so how do I talk about close communion based on this verse, which appears on maybe some of your communion cards that I have to fill out and hand to the elder? It kind of does and it kind of doesn't. I actually think a better support for close communion is you proclaim collectively but you're not really a member of this congregation and you don't actually agree with it. So there's a lot of stuff about closed communion or it's actually open communion, but there's a long statement about the nature of the Lord's Supper in the bulletin. I've seen, I've seen the same thing in both cases. There's like the pastor wrote a treatise on the Lord's Supper and then at the end it tells you what you actually need to know, which is talk to the pastor, but it's at the wrong point in the bulletin so it's too late anyway. Okay, or I've seen a long, I've seen like a treatise about the Lord's Supper and it's, and if you agree with this, right. belly on up, you know, and it's like, all right, well, whatever. And that's a neglect of oversight, but the first one is a neglect of reality, which is they don't know what you're talking about. Just put at the beginning of the service, if you, are, if you haven't communed here before, please speak to the pastor and just get vested fast enough. Or, if that's not going to happen, you, I don't know, ask people at the rail. That's, I got, you got to do it. Do you do that? Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm not shy. Okay. I'm, and if you're not embarrassed, they're not embarrassed, typically. So. That's so much of life is contained in that statement. And, and, so many people want, <laughs> and, and so many people come in after you have that opportunity, right, yeah. to talk to people yeah. before the service. That's and right. so you, you have to. That's on that. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. Right, you just do the shorthand at the rail, though, of are you a member of Missouri Synod Congregation? Or yeah, you, you're kind of pressed by, by necessity yeah. at that point. Yeah. So I right. ask, are, are you a confirmed member of a Missouri Synod Church? They look at me like, huh? <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Hey, I'll give you a blessing, you know? Okay. And it's not, it's, I mean, it's only awkward. When I, when I used to think that this might be awkward, yeah. but I haven't had any trouble doing it like that for years. Yeah, yeah it kind of sets your energy. That's right. It's gotten easier, smoother. Yeah. You know.
are you now or have you ever been a member of the Lutheran Church? <laughs> 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 <That's>... <laughs> right. There actually were cards at one time. Um, I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they can just hold that out, I guess. On the other hand, here is something we should do that we don't do, um, that the guys in Wyoming do. This is such and such a person visited and communed with us on Sunday, and that's really helpful for passport. I got, yeah. I was always like, I would get those, and then I'd be like, this is a really great thing, and then I never did it. <laughs> you know, you just, I don't know. I didn't think. Yeah. Because what it does, on the rarest of occasions, Bob's our member, he goes and communes at David's church because he's starting to be estranged from your own parish, and then you can at least say, hey, yeah. Bob, what's going on? Um, and so I made it better. I never got it from anywhere nearby. It was always some, some man in, like, South Dakota would send me a, your member communed here. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you care. I wish I cared that much. There you go. Well, that, well that, that's good. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. People know what's going on. But we will also talk to them at the rail and, and at least the blessing maybe that the children receive or maybe a Roman Catholic mother who, who just wants to be blessed yeah. next to her Missouri Synod son, yeah. the blessing does maybe help you do something there. So. Uh, yeah, it's not a... Now, Kleinig has a really great article called Pastoring by Blessing that if you haven't read it, you should find on his website because I think that's a very, very powerful, yeah, uh, on that regard. Lest you think it's just a formality. Yeah. So, I'm not, I'm not the, the most enormous fan ever of verse 28 as, like, the proof text for the doctrine of close communion, but... I mean, it, it's part of it. Examine himself or test himself is the reason that, although I definitely support younger communion, um, I don't support infant communion, and I, I really don't see how you squeeze it into the Bible, um, or squeeze it or run it through the Bible and come out on the other side. That's a debate that seems to have died down, but that, like everything in the Lutheran Church, I'm sure it'll come back. So. When the arguments for infant communion come back, I think the idea of you know knowing what's going on, understanding your sin, understanding what's happening here. The reason people argue for infant communion inside and outside the, the Lutheran church, I have found is because they're conflating the purposes of the sacraments. And they think that if baptism works in a certain way, then communion works in a certain way and is necessary for the same reasons, seems to me. The, the examination here, can, do, do we understand this historically as uh, you know, a pastor does the examination. I mean, somebody doesn't just confirm themselves into the faith. Well, specifically, Paul is telling the congregants to think about what they're doing, okay. which they're not doing, right. right? So by extension, prior to admission to the Lord's Supper, I would want the person to have some capacity to do so. I don't think that's tied to being, you know, in early puberty necessarily, as is you know, practice in connection with confirmation in the Lutheran Church, but I think it needs to be there. Anybody on age of communion discussion? I think it's a huge question um, for, uh, for, just for the church, just because there's so many different churches, different traditions, people move around the country, and what are you doing here, what are you doing there, why do you do what you do here? Well, why do you do what you do there? Um, and so, you know, so yeah, I mean, I guess from a history standpoint, I'm interested in, you know, is rationalism involved in delaying communion until the age of 14? Um, and if you're going to have it, why have it at a certain age or, or, you know, why think of it rationally, you know? And then if you do think of the faith in the little ones, you know, how little, I mean, if, I, I think from Augustine to Luther, it was around age seven in the West, but I could be wrong on that pretty consistently. I don't, I don't know about the Middle Ages in the West. I think the argument that, like, that examine what himself means a certain amount of data that's gone over in confirmation, the difficulty I have with that 
is one, in the Lord's Supper, I'm looking for repentance and faith and an understanding of what's happening in the Lord's Supper. And that's all I'm asking of the 52-year-old who hasn't studied anything since he was 14. So that's all I'm going to ask of the six-year-old, too. So that's kind of my thing there, is that there's a lot that is ver really very f kind of fake, or we're all kind of faking how much we know in connection with confirmation, because I really doubt that the 52-year-old knows what the 14-year-old does. He's probably forgotten most of it, but he still gets to take communion. The really heinous thing with open communion to me is if the poor kid is baptized and raised in the Lutheran church, he doesn't get to take communion until he's 14. But if he happened to grow up Baptist and he's 21 and he shows up, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> you know, so it's pretty sick. So the idea of intensive instruction at some point in your life that's great, but I just don't want to fake how much we're all supposed to know before we can take communion because I don't think it's biblical. And the other thing is, I think a lot of us as adults are lying to ourselves about how much we remember. So in that case, if it's about a certain amount of knowledge, just commune the 14-year-olds because it's fresh for them. Go ahead, David. <clears throat> what, a, you know... This isn't really on topic, but con um, early communion and then later more instruction confirmation or just earlier confirmation instruction doesn't matter? Yeah, no, because confirmation, see, confirmation is, is, is not a biblical right, not even by kind of extension or guess, but just on an anthropological level, it's kind of helpful to have something when everything inside and outside of them is changing and you kind of bring them in intensively at a certain point. That's totally fine. I and mean, if you want to do that earlier, that's fine too. Or you want to do it over five years and structure it differently, great. I just, I just don't think it's the same thing as what is necessary for reception of communion. That's... We don't teach that confirmation is a sacrament. Rome does. Yeah. Uh, we behave like confirmation is a sacrament, totally. and Rome doesn't. <laughs> Correct. Exact. Yeah. No, that's all right. We're all done. That's it. No, that's it. That's yeah. No, we're done. No, 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 no. You're fine. Go ahead. So I just want to ask the pastors in the room. Uh, you know, we were struggling with uh, the parents asking their younger kids, down to let's say around seven years old. Yeah. Hey, uh, they know what the sacrament is. They, they know what sin and, yeah. and grace are, and yeah. they know that this is where Jesus forgives, there's body and blood. Uh, and so confirmation, even before I arrived at my, my parish, it started getting pushed back and back and back to the point where confirmation and the instruction of confirmation was taking place around third and fourth grade, mm -hmm. which probably, which might be fine, and those kids are capable of a lot. Uh, but what I wanted to do with confirmation is an excuse for, as you said, intense instruction. Probably needed a couple more years. Yeah. So we just detached the two. Yep. You know, and uh, now we have like uh, it's just basic requirements. Can you memorize, you know, the, the Ten Commandments to read the Lord's Prayer? Do you, can you do the, Can you uh, recite the words of institution? And also tell me, uh, this is Jesus' body and blood, and why am I, why am I coming for the this? Yeah. If they can do those things, then. And uh, the parents seem to be pretty happy with that so far. And the older folks who remember confirmation growing up or actually have been so far pleased because the, they know it's going to be happening in seventh and eighth grade and they get to have the big photo album with gowns and stuff. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Really yeah, I, I would say, yeah, one reason, the only, the only reason, there's no biblical or theological reason why this is really a difficult question to answer because you're totally right. But you have to be respectful of the enormous cultural weight of confirmation in Lutheranism, which has nothing to do with the Bible or theology. And that's just the way it is, yeah. So if, when you do it that way, do you have a right for, do you use the right for early communion in the, in the agenda? And do you have a number of kids or do you just admit kids once they're ready? With uh, no fanfare. So, we, so the, the idea now is that we have uh, dinner with the pastor during Advent and Lent. So the kids who are interested with their parents come and eat with me and we talk about the Lord's Supper uh, out of the catechism. 
And then after that, uh, uh, we I to talk with the you know the, the kids, the parents together. We go through the things that are necessary. Or we, I ask the, the parents, are they ready? And I ask the child, are you ready? And uh, if that happens, if there's a small group of kids, then yes, we'll use the agenda uh, uh, right, which is really helpful when you're trying to explain to your elders that this can't happen, right? To say, no, oh, it's a legit thing, you see. It's a good book. Because I know, that's true. Half the time, they're saying, you're making this up, Pastor. You know that you're just born. You know. I'm just doing what's in the book. <laughs> right. That's, that's pretty so that's, No, that's extremely helpful. And so, yeah, Advent and Lent. I, I go through it with the kids who are interested, and the parents who think they're ready. And, uh, and the, the goal is, where I'm still working out this year, for the kids who have already gone through First Communion, that they would come back to these dinners. Right? And they're going to be there for soup suppers anyways, right, for midweek services. And, uh, and so the pastor's going to have his table with the kids and the parents, and they're going to continue to talk about the Lord's Supper you know, and, and the benefits of the sacrament. But all the way up until they get to the confirmation that we go through the more intense instruction on you know, the Bible, Ten Commandments, Creed, for sure. So, do any of you guys do this? I do a version of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not anymore, but, uh, I made a requirement for parents had to come to the confirmation classes. That's good. And then we'd have time to like split off, and they would do some of the teaching. And I sold it as, you guys, how long ago did you do this? How much do you really remember? Oh, well, yeah. So, uh, and then also sent homework with them. Now teach this to your child. You know, I based it all on what Luther said. This is for the parents to do, not the past. Of course. So, yes. Can you take a little gallop full of the room and just see what each guy is kind of doing in yeah. terms of age or whatever? William had his hand up though, so he's going to have it. Uh, so, uh, just a practical question. Uh, when we start uh, commuting young members in our congregation, uh, which I uh, fully support, uh, what happens when these kids are with their parents on vacation? They walk in some place where the pastor uh, maybe even has brought it up, and there's been heavy resistance on the part of his elders, and now uh, that pastor's placed in a really hard position. The pastor can say no. I, well, I mean, the pastor can say I no. Always, that's why I ask. Uh, uh, so, but uh, being denied communion because that congregation obviously isn't ready for it and hasn't, uh, hasn't done this, uh, what advice do you give the fathers when they take Johnny to church and that pastor says, hey, you can't take communion because you're not old enough? Uh, should, the, should the father, like, not in an angry way, but just say, hey, they're different, but they do things a little differently here, and then, like, the whole family not commune? Should dad go up to communion? Uh, because I get probably four or five phone calls every year about this. And it seems like we're doing a lot of different things across the board. You get you get phone calls from potential visitors? Uh, visitors, once in a while, a pastor who maybe it's his kid, maybe uh, maybe he's got someone coming to his, uh, that's going to be visiting his church and he knows about it, and he doesn't know how to address it and how to help that father, because we don't want to give offense to these little children, right? Um, yeah, but, uh, okay, I mean, the attitude I have taught my children is, it's not your right to take communion anywhere. And that's what they learned, and they're fine with that. And there have been times where, you know, it's, you know, it's, it would just be, the pastor thinks it would be weird for them to take communion, so they don't take communion. It's not a big deal, um, you know, they understand. I mean, I think, I think cultivating in children the same attitude that is so horrendous in older members which is, I've never seen this or I don't like this, so I'm offended, is not something I want to do. So I don't do it with my own children. I'm like, you know, you were admitted to communion, you received instruction, I instructed you, I know you can commune, but I'm not in charge at this altar and that's okay. And they're like, okay, that's fine, you know. Go ahead. A colleague of yours that I, I respect a great deal, his argument was against splitting these things up and doing this, his, his concern was, because we're not all on the same page across the that just creates confusion. Like that's it was, you know, you might know what I'm talking about. Anyway. <laughs> I don't exactly, but I think that's a hilarious assumption to make when you're talking about admission to communion or confirmation practice in the Missouri Synod. 
We all are on the same page on that. Until you wanted to admit younger children, it's like, right. wow, you just assumed a lot, but, you yeah, know. But, was, but yeah. That was the argument. Yeah. He, he thought it was detrimental <laughs> to unity, even like unless I mean his argument is well, unless you maybe get your circuit on board or something like yeah. he just didn't he didn't think like a lone congregation in a circuit just doing it on their own was helpful. He wanted to see more um, more unity, more working together, even even if it's just among a circuit saying sure. here's here's what we're all gonna do because it's like, but sure. And they and they took uh, his advice. You know, this this uh, I I won't actually hear what it was. I, but uh, with the circuit actually had a forum where they talked about this yeah. for the purpose of admitting the, uh, the the younger kids to communion. Yeah. If they had been uh, uh, trained up and they're prepared. Yeah. Uh, anywhere in the circuit. Right. So at least they have. And I think that's great yeah. if those processes are not broken. Right which in many, many cases they are, and the idea that I'm gonna take seriously this guy's objection to communing like some nine-year-old girl whose dad brings her to church every week, but I know he practices open communion. There, there's, not, there, there's insufficient trust to have that discussion outside, outside you know, certain circuits. So that's, that's part of the difficulty. It, these, are, these are the kinds of questions that really show you what is happening. That, that's why I like them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first name, middle name, last name, and what do you do for a communion and confirmation? <laughs> oh, let's give this man his certificate before we forget. I wrote sniper on the bottom of it. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to put that up. and um, Next to the picture of the class. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Go ahead. Uh, Jonathan Olson. So I'm at... Uh, <laughs> All right, um, so what do we do? We, uh, we have a Learn by Heart program, so yeah. we encourage the kids yeah. from early on to just start memorizing, which some of the things, Lord's Prayer, they're already memorizing because they're saying it at church every Sunday. Yeah. Um, and then I'll meet with the, pa with the parents uh, to decide, you know, is, is the child ready? And, we, and then we'll talk through things. Um, but we still do uh, the confirmation tied to the communion. So. Uh, if the child's ready, then we do the instruction. So it's a year of uh, catechism, a year of the Bible, uh, and then confirmation. So. At what age do you admit communicants to the altar? Uh, or at what age is your parent? Adrian Cheryl, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Somewhere in that range. That's when they start or that's when they're done and they're admitted? In that range, we may have communicants. We don't have communicants younger yeah. than an act. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, I don't think we have an age limit in our tradition. Um, it, it's, it's really when the child and the parents and the pastor get together with the child. And there are, you know, uh, I think as Pastor Plenty said, there's, you know, you, you know the catechism, you know the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know the words of institution, you know what you're receiving and why. Yeah. Um, and, but, Otherwise, so I, I think, and, and, I'm, and I'm new, so uh, I think the question will become for me, uh, we currently have four confirmants and they are kind of in that range. Um, but I think the question becomes, when, once you get a class that's got, you know, really young to, to much older, uh, you know, how that kind of works too. So. Do they finish the three years in order, and then they take communion or? We have two years of instruction, usually. I mean, so it used to be seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. We'd kind of push it fourth, right. fifth, sixth grade. Two years catechism instruction coming to the Lord. So, um, okay. so. Um, I'm trying to implement the first communion and push confirmation age to higher, to later. Um, and okay. so, so um, what ages are you looking at for those two things? Well, my kids are confirmation ages now, so it's just the idea of, of having a first communion because they don't have a lot of kids. Yeah. And so, but trying to, to get the congregation on board with the idea of separating first communion from confirmation. Okay. And I really, I'm going to still Pastor Flammy's idea and do the dinners okay. Advent Lent. I think that's great. Yes. You're a member. Uh, so we do three years of catechism. I've just tried to not use the word confirmation. Uh, so it's a year of Old Testament, year of New Testament. We use the bender. 
materials there for surveying just the basic narratives, gets them learning by heart. What age are the kids? I don't, I just don't make it about age. Um, so, I mean, so. What, who's, the, who's the youngest person taking oh, communion? Yeah. In terms of starting catechism class, it's third grade. So he's going to take communion at the end of fifth grade? Or he does, or he is, or? Yeah. Okay, okay. Youngest? Who's the youngest person? This is what we're really asking. Who's the youngest person that takes communion at your church? Seven years old. Seven years old, okay. Dave? Eleven. Eleven? Okay. I'm retired. Retired. I have done vacancy. And yeah. I did uh, confirm a nine-year-old girl. Okay, you confirmed her. Not First Communion, okay. Jim? Just, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I'll say my congregation probably went 12 or so years without confirming anyone, you know. No. Like lack of supply or lack of demand or, or? Lack of pastor, lack of all kinds of things. Okay. I mean, some, <laughs> not many children yeah. and, and no pastor willing to teach them. So, um, okay. so okay. they farmed it out to other congregations to do the work. Okay. Uh, most people in my congregation are still of the thinking that you do it in seventh and eighth grade, eighth. but I have, let's say, worked on their thinking. And so now we're starting in fourth grade, okay. finishing at the end of sixth grade, okay. and communing then. Okay. Okay. Uh, eighth grade. Eighth grade. Um, there were two years of, con of instructions. I had a third grade, or I mean, started sixth grade instead of seventh grade. Yeah. But I often felt seventh graders are definitely ready, and sometimes some of these seventh graders that were ready then are starting to veer off from the gospel by eighth grade graduation. We got Adrian, Bob, Chris, do you want to? Uh, ten. Ten, okay. Does Pastor Melis, does he separate communion and confirmation, or is it just? No, he runs it all together, and it's a two year program. Okay, all right. Confirmation as young as six or seven. Confirmation, okay. Two years, one year, six days, natu six natural days. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get through the six chief parts and other relevant biblical things. <clears throat> My people live by the grade, so we're still doing Seventh and eighth grade, and the kids are confirmed and receive first communion after eighth grade. Um, I. Uh, but we got we got we got all the way to you before we got the standard. What I think of as the process. Correct. I'm trying to change that. I, and I hear from good pastors that I should move confirmation instruction up and then confirm and then commune. And I hear good pastors say, no, you should split these two things up and commune early and then confirm at the traditional age. So I'm always curious to hear what people are doing. It's a two-year confirmation process. They receive first communion after the first year of instruction at age nine, confirmed at age 10, typically. Interesting. So you do have kind of a standard start, but it's an early start yeah. relative to David. Okay. And Kelly, you kind of told us, but do you want to add anything? Uh, same the standards. Seventh grade was full year Bible, eighth grade full year catechism, and then first communion on uh, Palm Sunday. <clears throat> We're right now, I've been moving it back. We're at 11's our youngest right now, but I'm hoping this year because more children and um, um, who was oh, the, the Benson's kids yeah. helped spark a conversation. I tried it. Don't do what I did. It's like I think my first or second year I tried to move it earlier and I just I did not do it well and it blew up in my face terribly. Um, long story. Um, so that didn't go well. But I, I think like having your kids there and communing them and the Benson's and some others that were there for the conference uh, sparked some conversations. I'm hoping to, to move it back and maybe even separate the two and I think we have interests so we'll see what happens. Uh, currently our kids are starting in sixth grade and finishing at the Missouri standard of eighth grade. Uh, we have uh, we have um, kind of begun discussing it kind of on the uh, premise of 
what happens uh, uh, just you know hypothetical if a visitor showed up and they have young kids and they asked me to commune them like how big of a deal uh, is this going to be and what are the theological underpinnings of this uh, and they thought that I was talking about my own children uh, which is awesome because my daughter is now seven uh, but I'd like it not to be limited to that uh, moving forward so we're I've only been there a year and a half so yeah. we're beginning the conversation yeah. and I don't think that it'll be a huge deal but it is obviously a big change yeah. okay yes sir what do they do at Redeemer in Fort Wayne? <laughs> where, uh, where you go to church, right? Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the kids starts communion instruction whenever, which is, um, how many hours would that be? You're probably talking like 10 to 12 hours. I, it's Saturday mornings, but it's for like three months. So 12 hours of instruction. The kid has to know the catechism, that is, Ten Commandments to Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the proof texts for baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper. So they have to know the words of institution, for example, and be able to recite them. And then they, are, then they take communion. Confirmation happens over at least two years of similar Saturdays in the spring, so in the beginning of the year, and that is kind of whenever, but I will say that the force of confirmation is totally different when it's not a lead up to, it's not really a lead up to something, it's kind of more instruction. And there are kids that go to confirmation for like four years before they actually go through the rite of confirmation, because it's just instruction, it's not, they're taking communion. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Floyd. If, um, if children have received communion, I have no problem with that, at an younger age, and then instruction comes after, what is the purpose then of a confirmation right? Because traditionally, the children have been instructed, they're presented to the congregation, they should, they should be able to examine themselves and see the Lord's Supper worthy, what is the point of a ritual then? Oh, okay. The ritual... So, just the thing that's like in the Missouri Senate agenda is supposedly not really about the Lord's Supper. It's about baptism. That is, the confirmation rite is a mirror image of the baptismal rite, where in the baptismal rite, you have, the same, you have m many of the same words as in the confirmation rite, but the burden is on the sponsors or the parents to say the words in the baptismal rite, and then the child recites those things for himself in the confirmation rite. The actual answer is there is no point. <laughs> That's the actual answer. I mean, if we have Martin <laughs> Kemnitz arguing for hundreds of pages, confirmation stinks, and then we all have confirmation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. Jim. That's right, and that was part of the reason why we had, we decided to make the seventh and eighth grade confirmation a thing to keep it there tell the kids, now you're an adult member of the church, whereas we didn't want to take away from them, uh, you know, their fervent desire maybe to receive the Lord's Supper. <laughs> but you're, you're right. I mean, the, there is instruction prior to admission to communion, but it's not the, you know, three years. I mean, some of this is really extensive, and if they're doing bender material, like, these kids know a lot if they're paying attention. That's it. Right. Uh, David, yeah. Are you saying your kids are voting members after they're confirmed? That's illegal in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of things are illegal in the state of Minnesota, yeah. <laughs> Do I go ahead? Yeah. Right. So I'm just going by, right, what the Constitution and bylaws were of my particular congregation in Podunk, New Mexico. Yeah. And it turned out that after you were confirmed, you were a voting member. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Right. <laughs> I have seen constitutions for this yeah. where confirmation is entirely removed. There's baptism, uh -huh. and then there's a period of instruction when you become a voting member. 
and there is no mention of concept or confirmation whatsoever. Okay, I mean, back to the point about what kids know, like in, yeah. at our place, we have chapel, all of the kids <coughs> in the church are in the school yeah. at those ages. So they're in chapel five days a week. They're having Bible classes for probably close to minimum three hours a week. Right. So by the time they're even through second or third grade, they probably honestly know more than most of their parents as far as biblical contact. Because I mean, they're, they're there every day. And they're, they're living it and hearing it and they're in this. Yeah. They're singing, memorizing hymns every week. I mean, they probably know more yeah. about hymns and the Bible than their parents do by the time they're right. in third grade easily. And so uh, for my congregation, it was entirely family driven. The pastor never said anything about a younger community. It was the parents and the children of God yeah. saying, this is what they know, this is what they love. Yeah. All right. I figured it was a good good thing to stop on because uh, we, I, I know many people are doing unusual things now, so something to discuss. Um, can we talk about why people are dying? Yeah. Okay. That is why many of you are weak and ill. So this is, this is why I think the, the, na- the notion of the unworthy manner is important because although it's not their intention, we saw from that verb, uh, you do not come together to eat the Lord's Supper, yet you do. Many of you are weak and ill and some have died. This is an understanding of the Lord's Supper where unworthy eating is harmful in tangible ways. Now, if that seems hard to believe, I think that has more to do with our understanding of what the Lord's Supper is actually doing than with, you know, trying to sort of try to explain how that works. I mean, um, that's what he's... For Paul, this is uh, offhand, obvious. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. That's why. Go ahead. Did we skip verse 29? Did I skip it? Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Yes, I'm sorry. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. Yeah, I'm sorry. So 29, our verb there is eats and drinks for himself judgment, not diakrinon, the body of the Lord, not perceiving uh, yeah, discerning is, is good too. Now what's interesting is that it does not say the body and blood of the Lord, it just says the body of the Lord. I don't, I don't think that that's sort of an insult or that the, the cup is lesser. I think it's just a synecdoche, you know, it's, it's the... Because he mentions drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's assuming that they go together. Again, that this is kind of a, this is something that Martin Chemnitz would have to go on for for like 20 pages, but he's assuming they're eating and drinking so you're not commuting in one kind, obviously. But when you're doing that, to do it unworthily is to, not, is to drink judgment on yourself. And the judgment may be expressed as weakness, sickness, even death. Okay, yeah. So uh, the, yeah, sometimes we hear crema, they're yeah. translated as uh, uh, you know condemnation yeah and I, and yeah. and so do you want to address that you know yeah. there's a difference in even the words between condemnation and judgment yeah. krima is not condemnation i mean condemnation is katakrima that's a condemnation krima is more generally judgment because because I d- i'm not even sure that paul's saying like you are going to hell specifically, but that you suffer these things, including weakness, sickness, and, and even death, physical death. Yeah, I, I've heard yeah. <laughs> uh, occasionally pastors take it as condemnation and, and say, you know, a, a person can go to hell if they, you know, receive this wrongly, and which to its nth degree, yes, of course, yeah. but um, yeah. it, that's not what Paul is saying. That's not, no, that's not exactly what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is that there, 
there, you are incurring something, not necessarily condemnation to the seventh ring of hell, but other consequences at the very least. Yeah. Comes out of King James, uh, eats and drinks damnation oh, to it? himself. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it, 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 it is, especially when you're answering things kind of off the cuff, you've never handled it before, or you're saying it in a sermon and you didn't think a whole lot about it, you're often replicating when you're making mistakes. I think you're replicating what you remember from the English Bible. And that may or may not actually be on point. So the judgment, the judgment is to work toward repentance, right? So that you don't get catacreed, right? He's not really touching it. He's not really touching that. He's just saying these consequences are because of this. That's all he's saying. I mean, he's not saying like, you got sick so that we, I mean, his explanation of it might be like, hey, this is gonna help you, but it's too late for those who have already died. So I think it's just an examination of consequence. Because what he's, then he's gonna expand in 31. He says, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. So the question is, is you're, you're either going to discern truly yourself and, and eat and drink worthily. And notice that Paul doesn't do this kind of like, well, nobody's really worthy because he doesn't mean you're sinless. He means, he means you, you know, understand what's going on and you're repentant, uh, you know. If you judge yourself, then you do not undergo the judgment incurred by unworthy eating and drinking. Yeah. Okay. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. So this is where he's saying what you just said, David, is now when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So just check the Greek real quick. 32. When we are paiduomitha, trained by the Lord. Again, this idea that suffering is purposive and curative and helpful. When we are judged by the Lord so that we may not be katakrithomen with the cosmos, condemned. That's condemned. That's damned there. Okay. So then, brothers mine, when you come together to eat, receive one another. Recognize where the church is. Recognize who is in Christ, because Christ himself is present, right? If you want to drink, okay, if you want to feast, do it in your house. When you come together, wait for one another. It's really, it, wait is very lame. It's ekdekesla. It's alelus ekdekesla. It's clearly receive one another. It's, pre, it's pretty simple. Okay. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. If I can sum up what's actually wrong specifically with the Corinthians, it's that, again, they take far too lightly the things of the Lord and far too seriously the things of the flesh. They take really seriously what they're going to eat and not at all seriously what Jesus is doing in the church and giving it and giving the church his body and blood. Okay. And about the other things, because he's going to he's going to start talking about spiritual gifts and kind of doing his own thing now from 12 through the end of the letter. But he says about the other things. So this could be other things that could go on a list of what's wrong or disputed in Corinth. He says, I'll talk about it when I get there. So there's probably plenty of other things going on, right? Anything else on the Lord's Supper we want to discuss before we, I want to do this comparative thing with governance, but yeah, yeah wait, go ahead. It came across something rather unusual. Yeah. Pastor in our circuit that tends to lean toward open communion sure. has said, well, I don't stop people from coming to communion because I believe that 
the penalty that they would incur would help them to understand how serious it is. <laughs> well, that for the very same reasons, I generally I wait I, I wait for the garbage truck to come in front of the house, and when I see it hurtling down the hill toward the cans at the bottom of my hill, I throw my children in front of the truck for the very same reason, because then they'll learn about trucks. I mean, it's like, you don't do it because you're worried about how it's going to upset people or you don't understand why it's holy. That's why you don't do it. Don't, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else on the Lord's Supper? Yeah, go ahead. Regarding um, close communion, yeah. the question is just how close? Um, years ago, I ran into a former pastor, was not the Synod. He was serving a congregation in the resort area. A lot of those recent people spent vacations there. They come to this church, they take communion. And he said to me, on the last day, I don't think my Lord is going to be too upset with me because I gave communion to a Missourian. Yeah. And I answered, the other way around. If you refuse, the Lord will say, he's my brother, you snubbed him. Um, another situation, the young man belonged to the Wisconsin church in certain day, certain day. Went to school for a while in Milwaukee, joined the Missouri Center Church there, understanding both pastors, you can take communion in Milwaukee, but not in a certain day. Later, he moved back home, okay. rejoined his Wisconsin Church yeah. in a certain day, both pastors, you can take communion in a certain day, but not in Milwaukee. You know, his convictions didn't change one bit when he crossed the certain county line. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how much weight we should put on church membership, making that the sole criteria. If, 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 a person, if we know from a person's own words that he's solemn moves, yeah. leave the same as we do, yeah. but he doesn't belong to our synod. Our synod, yeah. Yeah, the reason that is a tricky question, a difficult question, and worth discussing is because I'm even willing to say that there's somebody who's been in a Southern Baptist church his whole life, but happens to theologically be a Lutheran, and tells me five minutes before the service, I believe all this. Great, you're, you're gonna come back next week, or you're gonna go home off vacation and join a Missouri Synod church, because that's a natural conclusion of your theological convictions. People wanna separate taking communion from actually being a member of a church with a specific confession. In the case of differing synods, you know, here's my story time thing. My father-in-law is raised Wisconsin Synod, moves to a different part of Minnesota, Minnesota, okay, where there's no Wisconsin Synod church within 45 minutes. He doesn't even sincerely know in 1971, he didn't know that they were split. Why would he? He's a, he's a farmer. He, does, he doesn't care. He's not reading the, the magazines. He, doesn't, he simply didn't know there was any difference. And he shows up at a Missouri Synod church, and he just, and he joins. He doesn't know there's any difference whatsoever. Does he know about the distinction in the church and ministry debate? Does he need to, to take communion? Not so sure. The best answer I ever had for the, like, three Wisconsin Senate people that ever came to my church was your pastor probably doesn't want me to give you communion. So I'm not going to do that today. And they were visitors. I brought in Wisconsin Senate people and I had to tell them basically nothing new because they didn't even understand why they weren't supposed to pray with me to begin with. So all the stuff that, that distinguishes us is stuff that for the purposes of church membership, makes no sense and is even totally unknown. So for me, it's more a matter of kind of church politics and respecting the fact that this guy does really believe that the Wisconsin Synod is vastly different and I shouldn't commune as a member. That's why I'm not communing them, not because they, there's actually some other ground. I don't know. 
but we're talking about visitors. If they're going to live there, then it's, you know, just join this church. I probably don't need to tell you anything new. These things, uh, they are visitors, but they, it is more than a question of visiting. My father is a pastor. He's not a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor. He's coming to visit. He's my father. He's my teacher my whole life, but I will not commune with him. Uh, asinine in my estimation. Um, uh, we grew up in Bethany, Minnesota. There were these churches. This church doesn't even exist in your community. Mom and dad are coming. They're from that community. I'm still kind of that way myself, but this is my parish. And it, so they, they aren't just it, it, they aren't just these little questions. They become these questions. Is is mom and dad even Christian? <laughs> Am I even Christian? Um, uh, yeah, so, so what I would say, because I never had this opportunity, if I actually got warning from the Wisconsin Synod person, if his pastor is willing to let me commune him, that's fine. Because on a confessional basis, this has nothing to do, I'm not, it's not like I'm trying to ordain him <laughs> and I need him to figure out real quick what he thinks about church and ministry, which is what is probably taught at our schools to the teachers at the very least. So a lot of these things are kind of a joke. I'm just saying for the purposes of politeness, I don't want to do something that's going to make his pastor angry at him when he goes back to somewhere they actually have Wisconsin Senate Church. So we would hope that we are reaching out to Wells, I think, yeah. to have these discussions, right. um, but then most of our leaders don't even practice close communion themselves. So. Again, you're like, why should I care? Uh, I mean, you do care, don't get me wrong, but... I guess what I'm getting at is uh, a, a, a genuine, sincere, earnest, authentic Lutheran mm -hmm. who belongs to a, a different synod mm -hmm. who will be much closer to you in the eyes of God than many of the members of your own synod. Yeah. Yeah, well, and what I'm saying is the question of communion there is simply complicated by the fact that um, this is very difficult for his church that he belongs to to handle potentially, especially where the Wisconsin Synod teaches people about why we're bad, but not necessarily about the ELCA, right? They just know why they're not Missourians maybe. Right. So that's all I'm concerned about. It really, you know, I mean, it's like a lot of this is unnecessarily complex, which is what I'm also saying with the question of First Communion. You make it unnecessarily complex, you create all these difficulties. So you can't take communion until you're 14 and then don't take communion in a Wisconsin Synod Church because you might go to hell because they believe that the ministry originates out of the church or something. But also I heard that at Lutheran grade school, so I don't know what to think. You see what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, a lot of it is wildly absurd when you state aloud the things that are actually occurring, not just what is on paper. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, so, you know I, if I, if I often think about things like if my father-in-law wouldn't even, couldn't even be expected to know or care about this, should it be a condition for church membership? because he is a very loyal Lutheran man, you know? It's like, gets, it gets simpler when I think about it that way. Yeah, go ahead. So a couple of things thinking about. One would be, um, so I mean, earlier I thought you made the great point where a lot of times teaching-wise, you tell the people, it's about a pastoral care, mm -hmm. which I don't have over you, mm -hmm. and yep. so you can't come. And, mm -hmm. and that's the easiest way to just tell them. But I think there's other situations where especially if it's a theologically educated person yeah. of another confession, yep. now you can have that confessional conversation, which is tough, but I mean, uh, it, it's not as though, I mean, we're just saying, if we, if we have something on paper, yeah. how often do we say, at least we have it on paper? So there is something there, right? That at least we have things on paper. Um, what if I told you all the biggest problems I ever had were from lifelong Missouri Synod Lutherans? The box had the right label on it, but the theology was not inside, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> so, I guess so, so my, then my second point would be um, if, you, if you say, okay, it's not actually about church membership and the confession on the paper, but it's actually about what I know you believe in our relationship and that sort of thing, then it seems like, all right, now you've opened that door, and so now where does that stop? Does it start stop with the Bible believing Baptist who does it, you know, believes in the Bible and, so, you know, and, and or whoever else, right? Yeah. I mean, you just open, you can. I think, I think if you, the, the reason that you need this stuff on paper is because you have neither time nor opportunity, which I completely understand, to do the work of figuring it out and keeping the pastoral relationship and the instruction going. That's why. Because to the Baptist, if he tells me five minutes before the service, I believe everything in this bulletin, Pastor. And I've listened to these sermons and I listened to issues, et cetera, for 25 hours before I showed up here at church today. That's fine. I'm not ready to get this going that intensively right now. So we need to do some instruction and then I'll admit you to communion publicly for the benefit of everybody else. It's always a matter of pastoral oversight. It always is. Dysfunctions of that or confusions about that are because we can't or won't or don't exercise pastoral oversight. Because a mistake I made was thinking that the label on the box mattered. And when you are near fringy parts of the synod, especially, you realize how little the box matters. So that's when I just started doing pastoral oversight and instruction with everybody, even if they came with the right, inside the right box. Now, if they said, I'm Missouri Synod, I'll admit them to the communion right away, but I'm still doing the instruction. So that's kind of my meet you halfway thing. So, I don't know. Your dad's in a saltwater district. You know what I'm talking about. When you're near, fr- when you're near the fringy parts, you're like, yeah, I don't know that any of these labels, I'm not sure that any of these labels, they're not doing me any good, these labels. Except Wisconsin Synod people are reliably Lutheran. I never had a problem with. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It's a crazy world, right? I think, I, think, I think we always had this problem. I think we did. Um, but the demand for open communion kind of as a norm is, uh, I think that, that comes after we switch into English. But we did have it even when we're in German because the German Methodists always did open communion. So that was always a little bit of a pressure. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, that well, when, right. basically a long semantic, the old conference lines. Yeah. That, that warms my heart as well. But, yeah. Yeah, that's right. What would Wisconsin's, what, what is, I mean, I think most Missourians would at least grant to Wisconsin that we have, generally speaking, the same view of the supper, yeah. generally speaking, the same view of the small catechism. I think most Missouri Synod pastors in the field are probably comfortable communing a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran. Um, But if Wisconsin's position is such that we, that it isn't in any way reciprocated, um, then that's almost worrisome. Like they are the only Christians and we aren't even that. I mean. Um, I think think that the difficulty, yeah, I think the lack of reciprocation is not necessarily theological because when you learn enough of the history and you learn enough of the complications and how all of this, all the differences with church and ministry were on paper inside the old synodical conference and that didn't break it up even. But the lack of reciprocation, it's very similar to the the issue with confirmation in that even if you look at it and you think this doesn't really have theological substance, you still have to respect the historical weight, and especially for them, the institutional weight of what feels to them like unity inside the Wisconsin Synod, and then the fact that we much more openly will fight with each other, which they don't openly do. And that's kind of a function of their history and their size and the fact that they all go to the same seminary and lots of other things. So I think that's part of the, yeah. The, um the split 
Wisconsin Severian Township, Missouri. Yeah. I learned about, it happened a few days or a few weeks before. I learned about an opening service at first year college. Yeah. And the grounds was, was it Missouri's, it was something with the fellowship institute. Yeah. And uh, later on, it got to the point where Wisconsin was teaching their people. If, if you're at a table with people who are in Wisconsin Synod and it's in table pairs, you should put your fingers on the table to indicate that you're not praying with them. A W. So I've seen it. it. Yeah. A W. And, 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 and in, the, in the meeting, well, you know, when you have the district president in the meeting in our Yeah. four days before the congregation house is me, yeah. a member asked him, well, if you're visiting someone, in the hospital, one of your members, and lay in the next bed to ask you, will you pray with me? And his answer was, I would pray for her, but not with her. <laughs> so if she says, amen, you have to retract the prayer. Okay. No, if she starts the prayer, that's the, whatever. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, I, I respect the fact that it's, I mean, for me, it's like, not having grown up Lutheran. This is how weird confirmation looks to me. It looks the way that the Wisconsin Synod looks to non-Wisconsin Synod people. Like, why is it like this? But you kind of have to respect that because it's a big deal for some people. I, there's a Wisconsin Synod guy who's now in Wisconsin, used to be in Georgia, and I talk to him probably a couple times a year, and he's always telling me about disunity, but, you know, and I'm protecting his anonymity. He's in Wisconsin, he's Wisconsin Synod, so that could be like, almost any of them, right? Um, but they, they cannot openly discuss theological questions, because, even less so than we can, because they have to, because the corporate identity is very strong. I mean, you can go to Wisconsin Synod Church and the official news release from Synod gets played on a screen in the sanctuary when the service is over. I can't imagine doing that under any circumstances. Being like, here's what the Missouri Synod says about the world this month. Let's watch. You know, like, it's like, I just, I can't fathom a world in which I would do that. But that's something that happens. So it's, I respect that, even though I find it odd. Yeah. What Pastor Cheryl said about, they think that they're only Christians. Yeah. The teacher, lady teacher at the school where I was pastor at the time, yeah. she was in tears when, they, because one of her classmates thought, that only Wisconsin people going to heaven. I mean, they're that attitude I, I wish we could help them with it a little. We had Bethany University um, choir come here one time. Um, their choir director is Mar Marzoff. Yeah. Um, oh, the ELS school. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who who is a uh, who is a Missouri Synod Lutheran Fort Wayne man, but he's their choir director. And so they have Missouri kids in the choir, they have Wells kids in the choir, they have ELS kids in the choir. Around the building as we're sending them out for housing yeah. are girls crying because they are simply in a Missouri Synod building. And so, I mean, it, it, these aren't insignificant things and it's, I don't know, it yeah. doesn't seem right to me, but... Well, they're not ours, so I got my own problem. <laughs> right. All right, we're, uh, we're at time for break, so we'll take 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and start the governing authority stuff.